Okay, so let's talk a little bit about touch um, <clears throat> before we start our, our drill. So I'm sure all of us have heard of therapists or other colleagues or whatnot that have been deemed to have good touch. Go see him because he has good touch. His, his soft tissue approach is very uh, efficient. He's very refined because he has good touch. Well, when you look at the cortical representation of touch, you will see that it's represented in our sensory cortex. So sensory cortex is what processes touch. Such that <clears throat> the representation is based on the density of sensory innervation of the area rather than the area's total surface area. So things that are in our body that are bigger are not represented necessarily more in our sensory cortex. Does that make sense? Such that when you look at the representation of sensory cortex, we have about 100 times more cortical representation in our sensory cortex for our hands, and specifically our fingers, than any other area in the body, specifically with relation to anything in the trunk. Okay, 100 times more cortical tissue with respect to our hands versus the trunk which is huge for us. That basically tells us, right off the bat, just by looking at how that's represented in the brain, that our hands are there as a sensory exploration tool, okay? Such that the better off we can get using our hands and perceiving all of the stuff that we just talked about. So the better off you can get at finding tissue, assessing tissue, the neuronal excitation or the mapping that you have in your sensory cortex for your hands starts to become refined, right? Just like any other area of the brain, we specifically talk about you know, brain plasticity with respect to movement or cognitive things. But the brain is highly plastic to our sensory, uh, in our sensory cortex as well. So the more you practice, the better off you get at understanding these concepts, locating tissue and assessing tissue, the more plastic your sensory cortex becomes and the better cortical representation you have in your sensory cortex for your hands. That's how we start to refine touch. That's how all those people that we deem have, that have good touch got good touch because they started to refine the representation of their hands in their sensory cortex. So if you look at it, <clears throat> I've been teaching uh, FAP now for probably 10 years, okay? right since I graduated, started teaching F FAP. We've been teaching FR now for five or six years. Every single time I teach a seminar, every single time I'm in practice, I'm constantly refining my ability to touch, such that I'm creating altering maps every single time I put my hands on somebody in, in the representation of my fingers, okay? So it's our job this weekend to start to really hone in on our fingers, okay? So we are going to be pretty diligent in making you very specific in your ability to get on a tissue and your ability to assess a tissue, okay? If you take that one step further and you actually look at uh, touch at a deeper level, uh, our ability to touch someone has beneficial effects uh, on other things, such as pain control. Uh, so it decreases representation or excitation in the limbic system. It makes people feel better. It makes people relax. But on top of that, there's a specific form of touch that we call haptic perception. And haptic perception is a, a specific form of touch that allows us to use our hands as the mode of perception such that it's a sensation. Haptic perception is a sensation. It, it goes to our sensory cortex, but it's the way we've trained our hands or continue to train our hands to perceive what it is that we need to perceive, okay? So when you look at us as therapists, our ability to haptically perceive something comes from our ability to get into tissue, to be able to deform tissue to be able to explore tissue. By using uh, exploration and deformation, there's a specific form of haptic perception 
called dynamic effortful touch. So we are trying to hone our perception of dynamic effortful touch. When you look at the process of dynamic effortful touch, it's manifested by everything that we just went, went through. So dynamic effortful touch is not just here is a structure I'm going to put my hands on it. Here is a structure I'm going to trace that structure out. I'm going to palpate that structure. I'm going to start moving the limb that's associated with that structure through a range of motion so that I start deforming the tissue. So I start exploring that particular tissue. By doing deformation and exploration, I start to gain sensory information in my hand because on top of my actual contact hand, I have another hand that's going to be moving something in a particular direction. So I can pick up information from this hand too. So I have a contact hand on the tissue. I have another hand that's actually moving the particular limb such that I have two hands now that are haptically perceiving. One is doing a motion. So by doing a motion, I can get a sense of where that end feel is. I have one that's perceiving, is this neurologically tight? Is this mechanical tension? What's the temperature of this tissue? What's the texture of this tissue? Is there force coming back at my hand? All that information goes back to your sensory cortex and allows you to then make a clinical decision, right? We make clinical decisions I feel this, I'm going to do this. That's haptic perception because you've actually taken information that's coming at you from your hands. It's gone back to your sensory cortex that you're starting to, you're starting to refine this weekend and you're continually refining all the time so that once you start to feel something, automatically it triggers something in your brain to say, I should do this with this particular tissue. Does that make sense? We have to really not only hone our ability to touch stuff, we have to hone our ability to touch stuff, to explore stuff, to deform stuff, to learn how to coordinate a contact hand with a non-contact hand, to coordinate our body position, to coordinate our patient's position, because all of that stuff is really important for us to pick up as much information that we can as the therapist, because all that information is going to help us make better clinical management decisions. You always want to correlate what you feel with what you're going to do. Because if there's a mismatch between what you feel and what you're going to do, clinical outcomes are going to suffer uh, tremendously. And you're not going to achieve what you're going to want to achieve. And that's just going to lead to frustration on your part and your patient's part. Okay? So we're going to spend the next day and a half doing this kind of stuff. Because as we start to go into the first part of this, we learn how to find tissue and assess tissue. The second half of the weekend, we learn how to find tissue, assess tissue, and make a clinical management decision. What do we do with that tissue? Right? Do we FR that tissue? Do we do something else to that tissue? Do we need to take our hands away from that tissue and start assessing the joint that's correlated to that particular tissue? All of those management decisions, which we don't really think all that much about when we're doing it, are governed by what we feel. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So we're really going to try to have to hone all of that stuff this weekend so that by the time you get finished this weekend, not only did you enjoy the course, um, but you can get back into practice on Monday and take all that information and start really applying it to your patient population. Because I think it, you'll, you'll find that the way we've made the course and then added principles, um, it really helps you hone your clinical management decisions based on what it is that you're going to feel. Okay?